بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كتاب الآداب The Book of Etiquettes Let's take the first chapter about naming oneself with the name of the Prophet but not giving oneself the kunya of the Prophet. Jabir reports that a child was born to a person among us and he named his child Muhammad. The people did not allow him to name him with the name of the Prophet. So this man, the father, he went to the Prophet and informed him about this to which the Prophet replied تَسَمُّوا بِسْمِي وَلَا تَكْتَنُوا بِكُنْيَتِي فَإِنَّمَا أَنَا قَاسِمْ أَقْسِمُ بَيْنَكُمْ You can name yourselves with my name, but do not give yourselves my kunya, because I am the qasim, the one who distributes, I distribute amongst you. Also in the chapter, the Prophet was at Baqir, and the person called out the kunya, Abu al-Qasim, and this is the Prophet's kunya, he turned towards him, and the caller said, No, I did not mean you, O Messenger of Allah. I meant to call another person. To which the Prophet said, تَسَمُّوا بِسْمِي وَلَا تَكَنُّوا بِكُنْيَتِي You can name yourselves with my name, but do not give yourselves my kunya. So, what can we take from this? We can take that you can name your children Muhammad. It's clearly an order format, but does this mean it is obligatory? The answer is no. At best, we can say it is permissible, because we have plenty of other evidence which suggests to us that this is not an order by way of obligation. Rather, it is an order by way of permissibility. But then he goes on to say وَلَا تَكَنُّوا بِكُنْيَتِي and the other version is وَلَا تَكْتَنُوا بِكُنْيَتِي It means the same thing. Your kunya is when you have abu something or for a woman it will be um something. So it is like a nickname. The ulama have disagreed about this matter that is the matter of the kunya. Some said that it is an outright prohibition. Others said that what is prohibited is to combine between the two so that a man's name is Muhammad and at the same time his kunya is Abu al-Qasim. But out of these two opinions, what is apparent is that it is not about combination, it is about just naming yourself Abu al-Qasim, even if your name happens to be other than Muhammad. And the other difference is, was that prohibition just for the lifetime of the Prophet, or does it continue to after the lifetime of the Prophet? Most scholars here say that this prohibition was for the lifetime of the Prophet only, but after the lifetime of the Prophet, you're allowed to give yourself the kunya Abu al-Qasim. The reason they give is given in the narration that a person called out Abu al-Qasim and the Prophet looked towards him, thinking that he's been called. So the Prophet wants to remove any misunderstanding because it will be annoying when somebody calls out Abu al-Qasim and the Prophet looks to him to turn his attention to him, but the caller did not intend to call the Prophet, rather he intended someone else. So to erase this misunderstanding, the Prophet gave this prohibition. But of course this problem does not exist after the Prophet's death. We also find a useful narration in Ibn Habban's collection where the Prophet said لا تجمعوا بين اسمي وكنيتي Do not combine between my kunya and my name. And this appears to be general during the life of the Prophet and after his life as well. So we say that this is the better opinion. Do not combine between the Prophet's name and his kunya. You can have one but not both. Another hadith of the chapter from Ibn Umar the Prophet said, Inna ahabba al asma'i ila Allahi, Abdullah wa Abdurrahman. Verily, the most beloved names to Allah are Abdullah and Abdurrahman. These names mean a servitude to Allah Jalla wa ala. So, names which have servitude to Allah, they are beloved to Allah Jalla wa ala. So, Abd with any of the names of Allah, these are most beloved. But the most beloved of all of them are these two just mentioned in the hadith. It's as if the Prophet is encouraging people to have these names. Many people are encouraged to give their children the name Muhammad, naming the son after the Prophet. But we find that Abdullah and Abdurrahman are even more beloved to Allah Jalla wa ala than the name Muhammad. And the evidence is this hadith. Also we find he says that I am Qasim, the one who distributes. The Prophet does not distribute in accordance with his own desires. That is distributing the spoils of war, the ghanima, the zakah and so on. Rather, he distributes in accordance with the words Allah Jalla wa ala commands. And this is what the Prophet says authentically that Allah is the Mu'ti, the one who gives, and I am the Qasim, the one who distributes. Let's just make a note about the preferred type of names. The best name, as we have learned, is Abdullah and Abdurrahman. The second best type of names are those which have Abd and a name of Allah, as in, for example, Abdul Aziz, Abdul Malik, and so on. Then in third place we have the names of the prophets and messengers. 
We know the Prophet ﷺ named his son from Maria, Ibrahim. And in fourth place, it will be names of those righteous people from the Muslimin. In fact, right in this chapter, we have a narration from al mughira ibn Shu'bah radiyallahu an. He says, when I came to Najran, there were Christians there, and they asked me, you Muslims, you recite in your Quran, Ya Ukhta Harun, O sister of Harun. They intend thereby Harun Islam, the Prophet. But they said, the problem is Musa was before Isa Islam by such and such years. al mughira says that he came to the Prophet to ask him about this. And the Prophet said, Innahum kanu yusammuna bi anbiya'ihim wassalihina qablahum. These people used to give their children names of the prophets and the righteous people before them. So that is to say, when they told her in the Quran, Ya Ukhta Harun, O sister of Harun, talking to Maryam, then her brother of Maryam could be called Harun, but they would name their children after the prophets and righteous people before them. So there is no contradiction here. And it is not like the Quran has got its history wrong. Then we have the fifth stage, and these are names with good meaning. And it is possible that a name with a goodly meaning rubs off on the child so that the child embraces the qualities of that name. So if the name is in Arabic as the first condition, and the second condition is that it has a good meaning in terms of the language, so lexically, and also shara'an, so in the sharia, then if these two conditions are met, one hopes that the goodness of the name will rub off on the characteristics of the child. Let us move to the next chapter about ugly names and names which are treated as ill omens. From Samurah ibn Jundub, he says the Prophet said, لا تسمي غلامك رباحا ولا يسارا ولا أفلح ولا نافعا Do not give your son the name of Rabah, meaning Prophet, and Yasar, meaning wealth, and Aflah, meaning more successful, and Nafir, meaning beneficial. And in another narration, he mentioned the same names, adding another name, Najih, meaning successful. And the Prophet says that it would be said, is such a person here, meaning for example, is Yasar here, Yasar meaning wealth, and the answer would be no, he's not here. So it would be as if you are saying there is no wealth here. We previously learned that the most beloved names to Allah are Abdullah and Abdurrahman. We know that Allah Jalla Ala loves certain names, as in that previous hadith, He loves certain people. Inna Allah yuhibbu tawabina wa yuhibbu al-mutatahirin. Allah loves the ones who make tawbah often and those who keep themselves pure. Inna Allah yuhibbu al-muttaqin. He loves those who have taqwa. Inna Allah yuhibbu al-muhsinin. Allah loves those who are muhsin, do good. He loves certain types of people. He loves certain types of names, some more than others. He loves certain types of places as well. As in Sahih Muslim, أَحَبُّ الْبِلَادِ إِلَى اللَّهِ مَسَاجِدُهَا وَأَبْغَضُ الْبِلَادِ إِلَى اللَّهِ أَسْوَاقُهَا The most beloved places to Allah are the masajid and the most hated places to Allah are the markets. And this is because in the markets you're most likely to forget Allah Jalla wa'ala as well as other matters like cheating and deceiving in order to sell your product, ripping people off and so on. We also know that Allah Jalla wa'ala loves certain people and He is loved. So love goes both ways. قُلْ إِنْ كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبُكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ So if you love Allah, then follow me, the Prophet is saying, Allah will love you and forgive your sins, and he is the forgiving, the merciful. And also from the hadith in the Sahih, the Prophet said, لَأُعْطِيَنَّ الرَّايَةَ غَدًا رَجُلًا يُحِبُّ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَيُحِبُّهُ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ I will give the flag tomorrow to a man who loves Allah and his messenger, and Allah and his messenger love him. So you see that love goes both ways. As for these names, which the Prophet mentioned, لا تسمي غلامك رباحا ولا يسارا ولا أفلح ولا نافعا And these names do have a positive meaning. Only as we find in one of the narrations, if it is said that is يسار, meaning wealth, is he here? And let's say he's not here. Somebody says, no, he's not here. Or maybe يسار does not answer you. If you're the superstitious type, you will see that as a bad omen that you're going to lose your wealth. So it is to prevent people from falling into evil omens. There are some other names mentioned in the chapter as well. Ya'la and Baraka. Ya'la meaning elevated and Baraka meaning blessing. So if the name is blessing and somebody says, is Baraka there? And he says, no, Baraka is not here. 
He's referring to the person, but Baraka means blessing. So it's as if he's saying, no, the blessing is not here. This is a negative sentence. Blessing is not here. That's definitely negative. And so a superstitious type of person would see it as an evil omen. When you hear or see something negative, the opposite of that is fa'al, perceiving a positive or a goodly omen, which encourages you to do things or to do what you set out to do. Evil omen discourage you from doing that which you set out to do. And this is impermissible to see evil omens. They do not have an effect on you. So it appears that this prohibition is to cut off the roots to evil omen. The next chapter about changing names which are not befitting and changing them to better names. Ibn Umar reports that a woman's name was Asiya, which means disobedient, and the Prophet said, Anti Jamila, your name is now Jamila, meaning beautiful. Also, Ibn Abbas reports that the name of the wife of the Prophet Juwayriya, her name used to be Barra, meaning pious from Bir. The Prophet changed her name to Juwayriya, and the reason is the Prophet disliked that it should be said, Kharaja min indi Barra that the Prophet has left the company of Barra. So that is, the Prophet has left the company of pious. Because there is something of double speak in this. Double speak when you say one thing and it can be interpreted one way or the other. Or when you speak a sentence, you make the listener understand it one way where you actually intend it the other way. And so if he has left the company of Barra, it has this idea that the Prophet has left righteousness. Because Barra is piety or righteousness. Now, this would not be a problem if a person has noble intention and he intends the wife of the Prophet, Barra. But the enemies of the Prophet could easily use this opportunity and say that the Prophet has left Barra. If the Prophet goes out of the home of Barra, meaning his wife, Juwayriya, they will intend that the Prophet has left righteousness, but you cannot pin any blame on them. You cannot accuse them of evil intent because they'll simply smokescreen their evil intent by saying, no, we meant Barra as in the wife of the Prophet. How dare you cast aspersions on us? So it will give them a nice little blanket to cover their evil, nefarious inner convictions. In another narration of the chapter, Zainab, the daughter of Umm Salama, Umm Salama being the wife of the Prophet, she says that my first name was Barra, but then the Prophet gave me the name of Zainab. And also Zainab bin Jahsh, another wife of the Prophet, her name was also Barra, and he gave her the name Zainab. So this narration is interesting because there were two women who went by the name of Barra. One was the daughter of Umm Salama, and the other one was the daughter of Jahsh. And both of these women, by the name of Barra, the Prophet changed their name to Zainab. So in totality, we have three women with the name of Barra. First one was Juwayriya, the second Zainab bin Umm Salama, and the third, Zainab bint Jahsh. For Zainab bint Umm Salama, the Prophet justified changing her name, saying, لا تزكوا أنفسكم الله أعلم بأهل البر منكم Do not hold yourself to be pious. Allah knows who are the people of piety from you. They asked what should we name her, and they said name her Zainab. So we find that even with adults, you can change your name. It's not too late. And we're talking about your first name, not your surname, because that is the name of your lineage. The next chapter about giving the title King of Kings from Abu Huraira the Prophet said Inna akhna asmin indallahi rajulun tasamma malikul amlak The vilest name in the sight of Allah is a person who names himself the King of Kings and in a wording la malika illa Allah azza wa jal There is no owner except Allah azza wa jal the reason for this prohibition should be clear enough, and this prohibition is far stronger than the prohibition of the other names that have preceded. Because with this type of title, you are directly competing with Allah Jalla wa ala. Allah is the King of Kings. Otherwise, there are many kings in the world. But Allah Jalla wa ala is the King of Kings. This status is solely for Allah. So if another person gives himself this status, then he's putting himself on a status which is reserved for Allah. And this is shirk. So we find that this is a shirki type of name or title. Whereas at least with the other names, there was no shirk involved. Also note, any variations of this name, Barra, should be avoided. For example, you could have Bar, and also names pertaining to Taqwa, for example, Taqi, and so on. And similarly, naming someone Ahkamul Hakimin or Amirul Umara, or something of that nature, which would mean judge of judges and 
so on, something denoting that you are supreme and uppermost, this would be similar to Malikul Amlak and therefore is Haram. Let's move to the next chapter about the tahnik and naming the children with the names of prophets. From Anas ibn Malik radiallahu anhu, he says, I took Abdullah ibn Abi Talha al-Ansari to the Prophet at the time of his birth. The Prophet was wearing woolen cloak and at that time the Prophet was besmearing the camels with tar. The Prophet asked, do you have any dried dates with you? I said yes. He took the dates and chewed them. Thereupon he opened the mouth of the baby and put the date in his mouth and the child began to lick it. Thereupon the Prophet said, Hubbul Ansar it tamar Dates are loved by the Ansar. And the Prophet named the child Abdullah. Most scholars say that the Tahnik is a Sunnah, which the father or anyone else should do. So you chew the dates and you put it into the mouth of the infant so it may lick the juice and so the child tastes something sweet. But of course, if the adult has some sort of contagious disease, which could pass over to the child, then you do not make tahnik, somebody else can. Note that it is only the juice that must enter the throat and stomach of the child. At this age, the child is unable to swallow solid food. So this is dangerous to put solid food into the throat of the child. It's just the juice and nothing solid must go in. Some may say that this tahnik was so that the child can receive the blessing of the saliva of the Prophet. But if that is the case, then the tahnik no longer is legislated in this day and age. But most scholars say that it is not about taking the blessing of the saliva of the Prophet, but rather this is just a practice that ought to be done, as the Prophet did so. Another example of tahnik and naming the child, Abu Musa reports that a child was born to him and he took it to the Prophet and the Prophet made tahnik on the child and named this child Ibrahim. Also, another example of tahnik, Asma bint Abi Bakr at the time of migration was pregnant with Abdullah ibn Az-Zubayr. She came to Quba and gave birth to Abdullah at that place and sent this newborn baby to the Prophet who made tahnik on him and the first thing that entered the child's stomach was the saliva of the Prophet. Then the Prophet rubbed the child with his hand and named him Abdullah. Then later on when the child was about seven or eight years old he came to the Prophet to give pledge of allegiance when the Prophet saw him, he smiled and accepted the Pledge of Allegiance from him. Also, Aisha narrates that children were taken to the Prophet to be blessed and tahnik be made on them. Also in the chapter, we find the Prophet changing the name of a child to Al-Munzir, which means the one who warns. Also from Anas ibn Malik, he says the Prophet had the sublimest of a character. He says, I had a brother called Abu Umair. When the Prophet came to him, he said, Ya Abu Umair, ma fa'ala nughair. O oh, Abu Umair, what did the nughair do? And the nughair is a type of bird. Abu Umair would play with it. We find from this narration that even children can have a kunya, as in Abu something. You don't have to literally be a biological father to have the kunya of Abu or even the kunya of Um. Also, you can use rhyming speech as long as you do not make an effort and that it comes naturally or almost naturally. You must not put yourself under some sort of hardship to make words rhyme. We also find that you can have pet birds in cages, let's say, as long as they are treated properly. Also, we find the Prophet ﷺ treating the kids with gentleness and in a light-hearted way. Let's take this next chapter about the permissibility of calling a boy my son, even if he's not your biological son. From Anas bin Malik, he says the Prophet addressed me as Ya Bunayya, O oh my son. Also, al mughira ibn Shu'ba reports that no one would ask the Prophet more questions about Ad-Dajjal than I. And the Prophet said to me, he says, Ay bunayya ma yunsibuka min. O oh my son, why are you worried about him? Innahu lay yadurrak. He will not harm you. al mughira says, but they're saying that he has rivers of water and mountains of bread. And the Prophet said, Huwa ahwanu ala Allahi min thalik but Ad-Dajjal will be more insignificant in the eyes of Allah than all of these things that belong to him. So we can take from the narration that you can call somebody my son even if he is not your biological son. And this is an expression of love and affection. And the Prophet ﷺ was not short on love and affection. 
As for the narration of Ad Dajjal, then more of these narrations are coming up in the signs of the hour. But even though Ad Dajjal will have much materialistic wealth and ability, but even then, the power of Allah Jalla wa'ala is such that he will be more insignificant than all the materialistic wealth and ability that he has. He will be more insignificant in the sight of Allah than all of the materialistic wealth. Let's move to the next chapter about seeking permission to enter. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri says we were in the company of Ubay bin Ka'b and Abu Musa al-Ash'ari came in a state of anger. He said, I ask you to bear witness in the name of Allah whether any one of you heard the Prophet saying that the permission to enter a house should be sought three times and if permission is granted you may enter otherwise you may turn back. Ubay bin Ka'b asked, why what is the matter? And Abu Musa replied that he sought permission to enter the home of Umar ibn al-Khattab three times but he did not permit me so I went back. Then I went to him today and visited him and informed him that I came to him yesterday and greeted him thrice but did not find a response so I went back. Umar told me, yes we did hear you but we were busy at that time but why did you not seek permission further? So that is, why did you return back? Abu Musa says that I replied, because the Prophet had taught us to seek permission three times otherwise return. Whereupon Umar said, I will beat your back unless you bring somebody who will witness to what you have said. Ubay bin Ka'b said, by Allah no one should stand with you to bear testimony except the youngest amongst us and he therefore told Abu Sa'id al-Khudri to stand up and Abu Sa'id bore witness to what Abu Musa al-Ashari reported from the Prophet. Okay, so the narration in question here is the statement of the Prophet Al-Isti'dhanu thalathun fa'in udhina lak wa illa farji'a You seek permission thrice within which if you are granted permission that is fine otherwise return back. So that is do not seek permission for the fourth time. If permission is not given to you then it means that either the homeowner is not in or he is in but he does not want to answer you because he's busy with other matters and he does not want to tell you to go away. It may also be that he has not heard you but even so we have to draw a line somewhere. Three times is as far as you go. Sometimes the homeowner may tell you to go away as in Surah An-Nur وَإِن قِيلَ لَكُمُ ارْجِعُوا فَارْجِعُوا هُوَ أَزْكَى لَكُمْ and if you are told to return back, meaning go away, then go away, this is purer for you. Now comes the controversial part. Some people of deviancy may use this narration to say that the Ahad narrations cannot be taken as they are and must not be believed in. Rather, you have to believe in the Mutawatir narrations. Why? Because Umar did not accept the hadith of Abu Musa al-Ash'ari until he brought forth a witness. Why is this? They will say because the news brought to you just by one person is not reliable. You need to have witnesses that will testify to this news item. In this case, the news item is that seeking permission is thrice. After that, you return back. Maybe somebody would suggest that Abu Musa al-Ash'ari is not a reliable hadith narrator. And that is impossible. Abu Musa is a companion and all the companions are trustworthy. And no scholar of hadith will dispute this fact. So that is just simply out of the question. Abu Musa is reliable, no doubt about that. The answer to this problem requires careful thought. Ponder over the context. Let's just remind ourselves of what's happened. It appears to us that Umar does not know about this hadith of seeking permission thrice. Otherwise, Umar would not have said or asked him, why did you not stay? And Abu Musa here is justifying why he did what he did. In other words, he is justifying it using the hadith. That is to say, he is defending his action. His action of returning back after seeking permission three times. Note here, he is defending his action. It is a maqam dafa It is a place or a context of defending your own actions. As you would do, let's say, in a court of law. Now, when you defend your actions, you of course bring forth evidence. People may in order to defend their actions, bring forth some sort of hadith which they have just fabricated their own selves. And this can easily happen in the future. Umar ibn al-Khattab wants to show the people that if you're going to defend your actions and you're going to use a hadith, you have to make sure that the hadith is authentic. That is to say, Umar ibn al-Khattab wants to close off any roots of people defending their own actions using fabricated or unverified a hadith. 
because that is easy to do. Anybody can perform any old nonsense action and use some sort of fabricated, made-up, baseless hadith to justify his action. Of course, Abu Musa al-Ash'ari did not do that. But Umar wants to set in the minds of the people this idea of making sure that a hadith is authentic. Did Umar not believe the hadith of Abu Musa al-Ash'ari? The answer is no, he believed it. But he wanted to set this precedence of people verifying what they say. In another narration of the same chapter, Ubay ibn Ka'ab said to Umar, Yes, what Abu Musa al-Ash'ari said, I have heard it as well. But do not be a punishment upon the companions of the messenger. And Umar replied, Subhanallah, inna ma sami'tu shay'an fa'ahbabtu an atathabbat. Subhanallah, I heard something and I wished it to be established or confirmed. So we can use this as evidence to say that when you hear a hadith, make sure it is authentic and do not just take it for granted. Where we cannot use this narration is to say that the ahad narrations cannot be accepted as they are. And rather the ahad narrations can be accepted as they are. The companions did it all the time. They heard a hadith from one person who is trustworthy, another companion that is, and they accepted it. Be it in matters of fiqh or aqidah. Note that there is no difference between fiqh and aqidah when it comes to the khabr al-ahad. If somebody tells you that there are five prayers in one day and night cycle. Is this a matter of fiqh? Well, the answer is it's a matter of fiqh. We find the Kitab al-Salah, the book of Salah, in books of fiqh. However, it is also a matter of aqidah. Why? Because the only reason you're praying five times a day is why? Because you first have this aqidah, this belief system or this conviction that you have to pray five times a day. The action of the Salah only follows after your aqidah. So the fiqh follows after the aqidah only. It's never a case that you pray five times a day first and thereafter believe that this is obligatory. Thus it becomes known that there is no difference between the fiqh and aqidah with regards to the ahad narrations. Now there is another interpretation to this controversy which does seem to make more sense. And this is to say that Umar ibn al-Khattab spent more time with the Prophet than Abu Musa al-Ash'ari and yet he did not hear anything like this from the Prophet. Had the Prophet said such a thing, he ought to have heard it, and yet he did not. So this means that Abu Musa al-Ash'ari may be mistaken in what he is claiming. Now that does not mean that Abu Musa is untrustworthy, because even a trustworthy person can make mistakes. And we have many examples where the companions of the Prophet did make mistakes, they were mistaken in certain aspects of their beliefs. And this is because they did not have full knowledge. And so because of this possibility that Abu Musa may be mistaken, he wanted Abu Musa to bring a witness. Because there is also the possibility that Umar himself is mistaken and there is a piece of knowledge that passed him by, which Abu Musa has. So both possibilities are open and therefore Umar an required a witness. We have other examples like this as well. Ali radiallahu an rejected the idea that a widow receives the mahar on account of the fact that the husband has not consummated marriage with her. That is, if the husband dies before consummating marriage with her. She receives the inheritance, but not the mahar. And when we look at the Qur'an, this is what is apparent. The Qur'an tells us that she receives the mahar, that is the full mahar, only when the marriage is consummated. Yet, when he was told that the widow does receive the mahar due to the narration concerning Barwa bint Washiq. Ali radiallahu an said, we will not leave what the Quran says based on some claims of an Arabi urinating on his heels. So you see, the point is that Ali radiallahu an believes he has knowledge contrary to the knowledge which he is hearing. That's why he did not accept this claim. And all companions are humans, they can make mistakes. That's always a possibility. Of course, in this case, we know that Ali radiallahu an was wrong because the authentic narration of Barwa tells us that the widowed woman is entitled to the full mahar even if the husband has not entered into privacy with her. Also, nowadays, we have doorbells. So, is it the same ruling that we are required to ring the doorbell three times? Well, not necessarily because doorbells are louder and a person is likely to hear on the first go. 
However, if somebody wants to ring the doorbell three times or the same thing with when you're phoning someone, then there is no problem. Though the ruling is not nearly as strong as if you were to seek permission verbally because the voice is not quite as powerful as a doorbell or the phone ringing. The next chapter about the disapproval of a person saying it is I when he is asked who is it. Jabir ibn Abdullah reports that I came to visit the Prophet and asked permission and the Prophet said who is it and I said it is I and the Prophet came out saying it is I, it is I. So we find from this narration the Prophet disapproved of this answer it is I because if you say it is I you're not informing the homeowner who you actually are. You have to say your name because otherwise it is annoying. The homeowner does not know who you are. However, one might say if you have a distinctive voice and you say it is I, then you can be recognized because of your distinctive voice. That would rationally make sense. However, we say in keeping with the apparent wording of the hadith, you should give your name. The next chapter about the prohibition of peeping in somebody's home. From Sahar bin Sa'ad as Sa'idi, he says a person peeped through the hole of the door of the house of the Prophet. The Prophet had a comb with him. It was a pointy object with which he was adjusting his hair. The Prophet said to this peeping person, لو أعلم أنك تنظر طعنت به في عينك إنما جعل الله الإذن من أجل البصر If I knew you were looking, I would have stabbed you in the eye with it. Allah has legislated seeking permission only to prevent people from peeking into others' homes. Also in the chapter, Abu Huraira reports that the Prophet said, لو أن رجلا اطلع عليك بغير إذن فخذفته بحصات ففقأت عينه ما كان عليك من جناح If a man looks into your home without your permission and you throw a pebble at him and you pop his eye out, there would be no sin upon you. So we find that if somebody peeps into your home, you are justified to pop his eye out and there will be no sin upon you and no blood money either. And this is a ta'seer or a punishment for such people. It is not a matter of defending yourself against others if they attack you because if that's the case then you have to warn them first before you defend yourself. Question, are you allowed to kill such a person? The answer is no. You're only allowed to attack the part of his body with which he transgressed against you and that is the eye. However, if he means to pop his eye out with a stone, let's say, with a knife, but he manages to attack another part of the face besides the eye, let's say the eyebrow or the cheek or some other part like that, is he a guarantor? You could argue in this case that he's a guarantor because he had no right to attack that part of the face. However, retaliation cannot be taken against him because he did something that was permitted for him to do, that is to attack the peeping person. So it would be similar to a person who, let's say, throws an arrow to catch a game animal, but he hits an innocent person instead, whom he did not mean to attack. You cannot take a retaliation against him, but he does still stand as a guarantor in terms of the blood money. We take from this hadith that spying on another person is impermissible. Spying in warfare situation against the enemy, that's a different ball game altogether. We are talking about just here in social, everyday affairs. Spying on each other is impermissible. But spying also includes overhearing things that you're not supposed to overhear. So if somebody is overhearing your conversation in your private home and you know about this, can you pop off his eardrums? So can we make that analogy? The answer is no, because looking at somebody's private affairs is worse than overhearing them. If this spying person is unaware of the punishment for peeping into other people's homes and he gets his eyes popped out, does he have the right to demand blood money? The answer is no, because the one who popped his eye out was within his rights. What if the homeowner leaves his door open and you're passing by and you look into the home? Again, you should not do this intentionally, and if you did it unintentionally, there is no sin upon you. But can the eyes be popped out? And the answer is no, because here there is a negligence on the part of the homeowner in leaving his door open. The eye popping out is when the homeowner has not left the door open and wants the privacy. And now you are really invading his privacy. Let's take the last chapter of this book. The Sudden Glance from Jarir ibn Abdullah. He asked the messenger about the sudden glance on the face of an unwahra moment and the Prophet told him to turn your glance away. This narration agrees with the ayah in Surah An-Nur 
قل للمؤمنين يغضوا من أبصارهم Tell the believing men to lower their gaze. The rule also applies to women as well if they are looking with desire. So the women are not allowed to look with desire, but they are allowed to look at non-mahram men without a desire, as Aisha was doing with these Abyssinians who were playing some war games in the masjid during the Eid time. Can we take this narration as evidence that the woman does not need to cover her face? Because here the Prophet is telling Jarir to turn his gaze away, which means he could have looked at the face of the woman which would then mean that the face was not covered. So does this mean that the woman does not have to cover the face? Well, you could argue both ways. Most scholars say that the woman does not need to cover her face. And this does appear to be the more balanced opinion, and that only the wives of the Prophet ﷺ were obligated to cover their faces. Because the hijab for them was stricter, as they were the Ummahatul Mu'minin. And the minority opinion is that every woman is obligated to wear the niqab and to cover the face. And whichever opinion the woman follows, it is to be respected. In any case, the men are to lower their gaze, regardless of what the woman is wearing. Okay, just a couple more points of benefit. When the Prophet said about the Dajjal, he is more trivial than that, then we can have two interpretations, either that he does have these materialistic possessions, like rivers, and mountains of food, but he will not be able to misguide the true mu'mineen, or we can say he will not have these materialistic possessions, and that whatever he does have would be illusions. Also, about the point of popping someone's eye out who's peeping in your home, what if you see a person peeping in someone else's home? Can you now throw a stone at his eye and pop it out? The majority opinion is yes you can because we have other narrations which talk about somebody peeping in people's homes and they pop his eye out. So it's not necessarily peeping in your personal home, but just peeping in other people's homes. So we say, yes, it is permissible to throw a stone at his eye and pop it out, even if he's not peeping in your home, but in someone else's home without their permission. Okay, let's take some review questions. So question number one. What is the ruling on giving yourself the Prophet's kunya and the Prophet's name, Muhammad? Question number two. Give some examples of where the Prophet changed negative names to positive names. Question number three. Some people use the hadith of Umar and Abu Musa al-Ash'ari seeking permission thrice to say that ahad narrations do not need to be accepted. How would you refute this deviant idea?